Well, let's pray as we uh, consider the year that's been and the year that is coming ahead. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that we can be here this day. We give you thanks and praise for all that you've done. And so we commit our time here to you. We pray that you'll help us be encouraged by the things that you have been doing and look in hope for what we eagerly desire you to do in the days to come. Father, we ask that we pray, acknowledge that uh, we are uh, part of your church, that this is your church. And we ask that you will grow it and bless it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, uh, as I, I gave away uh, in our prayer and, and I've been talking about, we're going to do something a bit different this morning and, and consider how things have been going for this past year. Some of the things that we've been uh, doing at church, some of the things that we've been uh, trying to do to grow the kingdom of God here, and then be prayerfully considering what the future may hold. Uh, I think one of the, the great things about uh, about times, days like this, even though it feels like a boring process going through annual meetings and ticking boxes and getting financial reports and this is and that's in order and dotting I's and crossing T's, but it actually is one of those opportunities to just stop and think back and see what has God been doing, how can we be thankful to God for what he's been doing, and what ought we to be trying to do by the power of God's spirit in the days to come. And so we're going to consider that uh, this morning, we're going to consider what God has been doing and look ahead uh, in hope for what we desire God to do in the days and the years to come. Uh, we're going to start off uh, by considering uh, what we just saw with our new little ones disappearing out the back. Uh, we have here uh, one of the things that's been going on uh, in our time, one of the things we're particularly thankful for, is our kids' church as well as our youth group, where uh, occasionally leaders don't die of food poisoning. Uh, it is a great blessing that God has blessed us with little ones at our church. Uh, we, I think we often uh, retell that story that when uh, Lynn and I came here, we came with our, at the time, two-year-old, which is a little bit scary to say given that she's now a ten-year-old, uh, but, but for those first few weeks she was the children's ministry and, and, and she went out the back and, and, and did kids' church on her own. Not the most exciting kids' church, I imagine, just meeting with mum, uh, but nevertheless, and in God's kindness... You all came, uh, and we've seen that ministry grow and grow. It started off as a ministry with just, a, you know, basically a lot of kids similar age to Naomi, and then we started seeing more kids that are around that kind of primary age, that junior school age, and then they started getting older, and, 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 and we found ourselves with an opportunity to, to start a youth group, or to basically combine forces with the Montague Church to, to keep the old glow youth group going as well, and that has been a tremendous blessing. Uh, one of the things we've, we've seen, one of the particular encouragements that I imagine you've all had, is that we used to, at first, we, we, we kind of four or five times a year, we would have kids running church. We'd have those kids' church Sundays, which we still do on occasions, but actually that's now just become the normal behaviour. And we are now seeing more and more just kids involved in serving us and serving our God in church. Demonstration, we saw it this morning, didn't we? We, where we had Addie up here singing, and it's been a wonderful blessing to have uh, lots of different people involved in that. Uh, there's been some cool things going on uh, behind the scenes. One of the other things, too, about our kids' church is that we started off with just everyone in. And really, for the first few years, it was just everyone in. And then we uh, created a second group. And now we've actually, when they go downstairs, they actually break into three age groups. We, we have our, our youngest ones, uh, who are called GLOW. Uh, the GLOW are the preschool kids, and, 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 and it's a time for them. They go downstairs, they do a bit of craft, they play. It's age-appropriate learning for, for kids that are, you know, yay big. Uh, it's, they have a lot of fun. It's a time where they just get start getting uh, that, that taster for, for, for learning about God. Uh, we then have our, our next group, uh, group, the Shine group, uh, who are our primary age kids. And that's probably the bulk of our kids going downstairs. Uh, we're using uh, stories and videos and games and craft and prayer to teach them about God. 
Uh, over the past year, at times, they've been following the sermon series, so they've been doing a Genesis series, although not quite hitting all the topics we've been hitting upstairs, but nevertheless, they've been looking at creation and the fall and the, the hope of redemption that comes from that. Uh, they also have done some other things downstairs. They've uh, been following uh, what's called the New City Catechism to basically uh, 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 learn some of those basics of the faith. Uh, they've spent a great deal of time thinking about the Trinity. Maybe we should be spending more time upstairs thinking about the Trinity, but they've been learning uh, that our God is one, He is three persons in one God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Uh, we also have our upper primary and kind of lower high school group, uh, Illuminate too, uh, and they have been meeting uh, in, the, in that back room at the hall, or the front room of the hall, uh, and that's been a, a place that we've been redeveloping over the past year. It's now uh, got a nice glass door in there and decked out with some couches, and it's a great space in the sun. They actually get sunlight which, you know, unfortunately we don't get quite in this building. Uh, but uh, it's a great spot for them, these uh, youth, to, to come along. It's not all of them necessarily come from Christian families either, but they get to give a taster of uh, the good news that we have. Uh, we've also seen some other things going on. Uh, at the Christian school, our church helps organise for a, uh, a, a Christian children's artist, Dan Warlow. I think Colin Buchanan, but just not quite as famous and a bit younger. Uh, he came along to perform at the Christian school earlier this year for the junior school there. Uh, and at the end of the concert, Dan finished with a clear gospel message. And we saw over 25 junior school kids uh, respond to that message, put their hand up, come forward, and be prayed for who wanted to, 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 to say they wanted to know more about Jesus and life lived for him. And so since then, uh, Lynn and I have been running a lunch group up at the Christian school for those kids and any other kids who are interested in coming along and investigating who Jesus is. Uh, on any given week, there might be 10 kids on a, on a long week, there might be 30 odd kids on a, on a busier week coming along, giving up their lunchtime uh, to come and have a lot of fun and hear about Jesus. And so be praying for that ministry. Uh, now that Lynn is uh, working at the school, she's just, I'm not turning up anymore. She's just doing that on her own and good things are happening. Be praying for that. Uh, on Friday nights, our youth group uh, is, is just, again, such an encouraging place to come along to. Uh, one of the things that I really was impressed with the group that we more or less took over is that sometimes youth groups are just entertaining kids for a couple of hours. It's just Epic, 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 epic game, and then, oh, by the way, uh, Jesus loves you, and then off you go home. But actually, this one has been, the foundations of it has been actually spending time in God's Word, spending time discussing those big issues of, of, of faith, and helping grow disciples of Jesus, and we're seeing wonderful things go on there. Uh, one of the stories that uh, is in my head just from Friday night, but uh, we, we actually have a decent percentage of our kids who come along have no church background whatsoever. Mum and dad don't go to church. Grandparents don't necessarily go to church. They are just coming, coming from non-Christian backgrounds, whether it be other religious backgrounds or just no faith backgrounds. And one of these kids from a, from a, a non-church background, on Friday night uh, during the talk, and Sam was doing the talk and doing a great job uh, teaching the kids about how we listen to God uh, by looking at his word. And one of the kids just puts his hand up in the talk. They are interactive, so it's, it's okay to do that. And says that the only reason I come here to youth group is that I can learn more about this God that you talk about. Isn't that the whole purpose of why we run things like youth group? Is so that kids have an opportunity to learn about God. And this kid, I can guarantee you, every week he holds me up with question after question after question. It is wonderful that we have ministries like that going on. Uh, a stat that I've talked about uh, in the past is one uh, that Graham Stanton talks about. He's the uh, director of the Centre for Children's and Youth Ministry at Ridley College in Melbourne. Basically, Ridley College is an Anglican training college in Melbourne. He's the guy that runs the children's and youth arm of it. Uh, he did a training session that some of you were part of several years ago, and he talked about that children who last at church as adults... Statistically, the ones that, 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 that keep going, that grow up in the church and stay in the church as adults, one of the things they have in common is they have five adults in their life who are not family members, but they know them by name and are willing to say today, how are you going, and hear their story. I wonder if you know the names of some of the young people that have been here this morning. 
I wonder when they come back in and they all fly down the aisle, if you can look at them and actually know them by name. Now, I, I expect there'll be one or two you may not know because, yeah, that's, 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 that's right. But what are you going to do about it? And I know you might strike up a conversation and, and they'll be awkward and nervous and whatever and they might grunt, they might not know what to say and you might go, well, I tried once, so I'll never try again. No, just try again next week and try again the week after. Build some friendships with these young people because they need the saints in their life who have gone through the tough times, who have gone through all the struggles of growing up. And yeah, sure, the age is different now to maybe the one you grew up in, but, but the human heart is still the same. The human heart is always tempted to give up on the faith for the same basic reasons. And they need people in their life who can help them. So can I encourage you to try and form those friendships. I can encourage parents in the room to encourage their, their young ones to be thinking that way as well. Uh, we looked at this passage earlier this year, but in Mark 10, there's that scene where, 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 where people were trying to bring children to Jesus and, and he was placing his hands on them. The disciples got in the way. They thought Jesus was a busy man. Keep the little ones away. The little ones aren't important. What does Jesus say? Let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Friends, we want to be a church that helps the children, whether they be as young uh, as, a, as a little Thomas out the back there, or, or, as, or as old as, or as, as some of our teenagers, like I saw Josh in front of me uh, just before. Uh, it doesn't matter what age they are, we want to not hinder them from being able to come to Jesus and find life in him. But of course, yes, we have a role as a church to do that, but ultimately, the scriptures don't say, church, make sure all the young ones get to hear the good news of Jesus. What does the scriptures say? Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. I don't think that means mums get away with not instructing their children, but I think maybe he's making a point that especially dads make sure you do this because that's not our default sometimes in life. We, we leave the spiritual to mum. But actually, one of the jobs of our families is to train and instruct our kids in the Lord. Make decisions for the sake of your kids knowing and trusting in Jesus. You are the ultimate model to them of the life of following him. Can I encourage you to be prayerfully doing what you can to lead your children to know and share the hope that we have. And that is why, as church, we are trying to help you do that. It's one of the reasons why, over this past uh, few months, we've been having some very, uh, uh, I guess, some, some topics we've been talking about at church that are pretty awkward to talk about in church, let's be honest. Uh, as we've been going through Genesis, We've been, yes, seeing that God is creator, but we've been seeing the, 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 the impact of him being creator and how he designed us to be, how that impacts on so many of the big issues of our day. We, we, we're talking about that because it's important to talk about that because it's an issue that is going on in our world and so we need to be prepared. But one of the other reasons why we're doing that is especially because we have these young people who we want to know the Lord Jesus because that is the world they are growing up into. These are the assumed values that our world has around areas around gender and sexuality in particular that I know have been hard for us to, to think through and they've been big topics. But we talk about them because we want to train and instruct them in the Lord. We want to equip their parents to know how to have those conversations. We want to equip them to know how to have those conversations as they grow up. Now, we don't just have children and young people. I, I was going to write old people... But I just wanted to write Emerson Park, which is a more neutral term, because I want to really, and Jan's looking at me awkwardly, but I really want to commend something that goes on every week that not people don't know about. Didn't make it my report, but it's making it in this, is that every week she is up there uh, with a group of the residents at Emerson Park and reads the Bible with them. Uh, some of them, uh, their eyesight has failed them or their ability to kind of comprehend things isn't quite what it once was. And so Jan meets up with them every week and brings a passage of scripture in giant print and reads it and discusses it with them. Friends, we've been talking a lot about young people, but I must say we want to be talking about 
honouring all generations, and especially those that are older. It's not just what happens in Edmonton Park, we want to honour those that are still able enough to be with us as well. And there's a verse in the Bible that doesn't get quoted much anymore. I suspect many of you grew up knowing this verse, because I watch what you do. Um, whereas my generation is not familiar with it, and we are quite rude. Uh, but there's a verse in Leviticus, Leviticus 19. Stand up in the presence of the aged, show respect for the elderly, and revere your God, I am the Lord. It's actually meant to be assumed behaviour for the people of God to honour those that have gone before us and to show respect for those who have gone before us and to care for those who have gone before us and to listen to those who have gone before us. And it's actually part of our worship of God that we do that. And so that's the reason why I wanted to particularly highlight what's going on at Everton Park. And I want to remind us that, yes, of course we are investing so much in the next generation. There's just obvious reasons why we need to do that, because the church dies if you don't do that. We know that. But that doesn't mean we neglect and reject those who have gone before. And so I really wanted to just highlight, because I know not many of you know that goes on, but it is really, really cool that it's going on. We have our mission partnerships with CMS and Tear Fund. Uh, of course, uh, we, we think of the Great Commission when Jesus, the ascended and risen, uh, so not ascended yet, about to ascend, but the risen Lord Jesus, his final words to his disciples, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Uh, we uh, quite intentionally uh, partner with these two wonderful organisations, CMS and TIER, or TIER Fund Australia, as they're, they're now known, uh, in the work they are doing in fulfilling the Great Commission. Uh, Earlier this year, I think it was in March, uh, we had uh, the CEO of TIER Fund with us, uh, Matthew Moore, and a, a few of you came along that night, as well as his offside of Ben Allsop, and it was a, a, a really encouraging night hearing the work that TIER are doing in, in, in providing uh, this sort of practical expression of the love of Christ in those hard places in the world where there is injustice in so many ways and they are trying to sh bring justice and bring God's love and God's peace into these places and, and through their actions bring in the kingdom of God. Uh, it was encouraging and we're continuing to partner with them. And then, of course, la uh, not last month anymore, but, but in June, we had Morris and Amanda Jacobson with us for that week, and I hope you were encouraged by that time and blessed by that time. I know uh, my family in particular really was blessed by that time we, we had to, 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 to spend with them and hear their story about how they are trying to uh, equip the local church in Cambodia and those, those young people who are going along to study at the Elam Bible College in rural Cambodia so they are equipped to go back to their rural towns and villages and bring the good news of Jesus. And so we've been partnering with them, we prayerfully support them, uh, but we also are giving towards those organisations, and I'm really encouraged that that is going on as well. Uh, we have our home groups as well, really. Uh, the home groups is also this verse. It's part of us going and baptising uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching people to obey everything I've commanded. Home groups are a vital part of our church life. We are meant to live the life of following Jesus in community with one another. It's great that we're here on a Sunday, but most of us need more encouragement than that. It doesn't have to be in a formal structure like a home group. You can have maybe a friend that you meet up with for a coffee and pray with, whatever it might be. But we want to be in, in this deeper community with one another so we can, we can continue to encourage each other to obey and follow the Lord Jesus and to live out the, the Great Commission and trying to make disciples. I'm really encouraged that we have our, our home groups. One of the things that uh, I really enjoyed during the week, one of my kind of funny highlights of my week, uh, was I was working upstairs here on a Thursday morning. I was trying to get some things done before my, my next meeting with someone. And downstairs was the Thursday morning men's group, the 65 Not Out Men. And all I could hear was this, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> just it's like this sort of hearty man laugh going on every couple of minutes. They were just enjoying each other's company. I'm sure they were doing something slightly more serious than just laughing together. But there's something really special about hearing a bunch of men just enjoying being in community with one another. Especially when there didn't need to be any alcohol or anything like that to cause them to enjoy 
that fellowship. It is a, a great encouragement. I love seeing uh, our, our ladies group as well. I often see you uh, meeting together after church and having little discussions and things like that. It is wonderful. Can I encourage if you're not part of one of these groups, talk to me later and, and it'd be great for you to join one. Uh, we also have our music ministry, and, and we've talked a bit about that before, but we are meant to sing and make a joyful noise to the Lord. In Paul in Colossians says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another for wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. It is, even though uh, uh, culturally it's unusual for us to sing anymore, we're not a singing culture, and sometimes we go, Oh, do we have to sing? Well, actually, it's what God. So he commands us to do because he is worthy of all glory and honour and praise and he has gifted us with voices. Some of us have better singing voices than others. I know some of you noticed that I almost had to sing last week. I sang a verse last week, a week before, and I think I sung it from about this distance so you didn't have to listen to too much. But when I'm out there, I try and belt it out and I hope we all belt it out because our voices blend together and make this joyful noise. Some people sound better, some people sound worse. It doesn't really matter. Because what we're doing is actually teaching and admonishing one another. We're building each other up as we do that. That's why the songs we sing matter. That's why the words we sing matter. Because they are praise to God, but they're also building each other. So I'm really thankful for those who, who serve us in that vital ministry. And I also want to just issue my usual reminder that I have a sneaking suspicion there is some musical talent in the congregation that may be maybe could be used to benefit the rest of the church. Speak to me or speak to Jane if you realise actually there are ways that you could be serving in that ministry. There's, I'm not trying to pretend that, that what I've just told you is everything that's going on, but there's been a lot of encouraging things going on over these past 12 months. Uh, there was one other thing that I, that I have in my report, uh, and that is, of course, uh, Forest, uh, the, the final sale of Forest did go through in the past... 12 months. Uh, now, I, I, when I think of Forest, I always have to find my mind going to this passage in 1 Corinthians. It's the one where there's a bit of debating about where, where some of the Corinthians say, I follow Paul or I follow Apollos. They've got this sort of divide over different leaders. But, but Paul makes the point, what after all was Apollos and what's Paul? They're only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each his task. Paul says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. What's the point of me putting up on the screen? I have, I see, I barely go a month without having someone tell me a story of how at some stage in their life they were part of that St. Bart's Forest congregation and they were blessed by their time there. That that might have been the place where they came to faith, that might have been the place their children came to faith, that was the place that sucked, blah, blah, came to faith, or, is it, or, is it, or it might not have been the initial coming to faith, but it was part of the watering of that faith. It was part of the God making that faith grow. And so I just want to acknowledge that a lot of good came out of the, the ministry that took place uh, at St. Bart's Forest. Uh, we should be thankful for God, for the good work that took place there, for the, the, the fruit that has come out of that. It is sad that it is closed, um, but lots of good has come out of there. It's given that I've got Patsy sitting right in front of me, I just want to say, well done, good and faithful servant, for all you did there. The Lord Jesus will say that in a much more compelling way one day, but well done. And we are thankful to have you join us here as well and continue to bless us as you've blessed so many others uh, during your time at St. Bart's. What about what's going on ahead? What are we hoping to have happen in the days and weeks and months ahead? Uh, I'm always a little bit nervous about, about making bold vision statements about what we're going to do. Uh, we kind of saw that in 2020, didn't we? Every church, uh, just about. Do you remember what they did in 2020? They had their 2020 vision. Because it was this great pun, wasn't it? Everyone got excited. We've got perfect vision of what's going ahead. These are the things that we're going to achieve. And then, I don't think anyone had as part of their 2020 vision. You know what? We're going to strategically not meet together for four months. We're going to close our doors from the church and just not meet. 
Not have any Sunday. But that's what. That's our plan. That's how we're going to grow. I don't think anyone said that. If they did, they really did have 2020 vision. And so what our psalm at the start said is that the Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. A little later it talks about that the, 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 the king can't trust in his own, uh, his own the, the size of his army. The warrior can't trust in his own strength. Uh, and a horse is a rather vain thing to put your hope in. And I want to suggest that whilst we're going to talk a bit now about our hopes ahead, we're going to talk a bit about things that sound a bit like uh, horses, so to speak, as we talk about how to basically increase the size of our building. They're futile if they aren't God's plans. And so, look, we pray and we seek God to be at work, but we cannot trust in our own strength. We cannot trust in our own buildings and our own processes. We ultimately need to be crying out to the Lord to see his purposes endure throughout all generations. But what are we trying to do? What are some things we're trying to do? And the most obvious one is something we talked about a few months ago. Uh, we have this healthy problem starting to develop. We need more seats. We need more space. Uh, this is a photo. I'm not the only one to take photos, but this is a photo I took one day earlier this year because the place was full and there were people out the back as well. And we are having that happen more and more often. We've actually had some weeks in winter, which never happens, but we've had some weeks in winter where we've been at pretty much at capacity. This morning we're kind of almost there, aren't we? Uh, once the kids come back in, the room feels relatively full. And so we've got to be considering, well, how are we going to be a place that actually can bring more people along? Because it's tempting when things are going relatively well. It's tempting when you look around and go, well, you know what? The building is relatively full. We can think, look at that and think, well, the job's pretty much done, isn't it? If, if the building's full, then what else is there left to do? We can sit back, we can relax, we can be content with the good things that have taken place. But there's a problem with that sort of thinking, isn't there? Uh, I, I sometimes like to bring up numbers, and I've brought up these numbers before, but the most optimistic estimate, and I think it's far too optimistic, the most optimistic estimate is that on any given Sunday across Circular Head, there might be 500 of the saints gathered in a place like this. I, I actually suspect it's more likely that if you did a month of Sundays and said anyone who turned up at least once on those four Sundays, and you totaled them all up, you get to a number close to 500 across all the different churches across Circular Head. There's 8,000 people, give or take, in Circular Head. That means that if, with our current capacity, because in this room, as things currently are, 80, 90 is about all we're fitting in this particular room. We can fit a few more at the back as things currently are. That's a very small number of the, the wider district that can actually fit with us. And we can say, well, we can start a second congregation. It's still a very small number. In fact, even if we increase our capacity to something like 150 people, which maybe we could do, there's still a whole heap of people out there. And it's not like we live in a regional centre like a Burnie or a Launceston. It's not like we live in the city, one of the cities like a Melbourne or a Sydney, where you can say, well, people have all sorts of opportunities to hear the good news. Because, you know, you might live in one location, but you work in a different area. And so you might encounter a Christian in this different area at work. Or you take your kids to a sporting team in a different area. Or you socialise in this different... And so there are all these different networks where you might encounter someone who has faith. Who do you think are the ones that need to share the good news of Jesus with the 7,500 people in our area that probably do not know the good news? It's not, well, the vast majority of them don't ever leave Sisters Hills. And almost no one else crosses Sisters Hills to come here. It's our job. And so our hearts have got to be that we love the Lord that we want to see God receiving the praise and the glory and the honour that he alone deserves. 
And the, 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 one of the primary ways he receives that is that when more people come to put their faith in his son who died for them, so they may have life and have it to the full, that they may share the hope that we have. Friends, we talk about the gospel, but sometimes remember the gospel literally just means good news. We have good news. And so we can get a bit awkward about this and think, oh, I'm not sure if I really want to go out there and talk about it because it's a bit awkward. We've got good news. Good news of joy to share with our world and our district. <coughs> with thousands of people who need to know the hope we have. So when it comes to thinking about capacity issues, we, our, our purpose isn't so that we can say, oh, on the Anglican Church, look how big it is. Look at us, we can fit so many people in our room. Look how wonderful our building looks. Look how uh, snazzy it looks or whatever it is. It's going to be because we love the Lord. Because we want to honour Him. We want to glorify Him. And we want to love circular head and help the lost be found. So what can we do about it? What can we do about our capacity issues? We, we asked that question earlier. We, we, Parish Council said, please give us feedback. And we had some feedback from you, which was really nice to hear. Uh, we had some out there ideas. We had, we, we had people pretty much talking about starting again, whether it be levelling the site or buying a new site and, and starting again. And but that might be an idea. It's possibly, there are probably a few steps before we go down that process. So I'm, I'm not suggesting we, we do that yet, but I love that big picture dreaming. We had other people talking about, well, we've got these ridiculously high rooms where the hot air goes up there and the cold air goes down here and you guys feel cold. So why don't we put people in the hot air section? Why don't we, why don't we create like a visit? And, and again, that could be an idea. It's a pretty significant process to maybe not get that many more people, but I love that kind of dreaming. Uh, but in the end, the, the, the basic plan that people uh, have, have and, and basically continue to put forward. It's one we've been talking about for about six or seven years now. And that's called uh, basically opening up that back room and, and, and creating an, an additional area to sit there. Uh, our back wall, uh, we've already received a quote from someone to what would be involved with basically taking out the back wall, putting uh, some glass bifold doors in so that we can close it off when we still only got maybe this many people. But we can open it up and create a whole additional area. For those of you who have been to funerals, you know you can fit a good 50-odd people back there. And so suddenly we can turn 80 or 90 into maybe something closer to 140, 150 people, which is a much more significant number. Uh, part of the reason as well why we're doing that uh, is, is that we've talked before about this 80% rule where, where basically once you get about 80% full, you stop growing because you just think it's full, you sit back in your laurels. So we're trying to get to a stage where we actually will have enough space that we can grow into that space because we want to see God being glorified and we want to see the lost being found. That's a pretty easy solution. It's not one that I think anyone's going to be feeling particularly angst about. Like it, it, we already almost do it anyway. We use that as a cry room. And, and yes, for those who are currently in the cry room, we'll be having conversations with you figuring out, well, how can we best create a cry room space with this new plan. Uh, an, a, a, an idea that's a little bit more advanced out there is basically doing a similar thing to the side here so we can create more space out there. That one's less fun, and maybe I'll talk more about that at the actual annual meeting afterwards if you would like. So that's a very simple plan to create some more space. But there's still another thing that we can do to create a greater seating capacity to help more people. And I appreciate this is the one which is probably the one that some of you are happy about and some will feel a level of sadness about if this is what we end up doing. And that is what, again, what we've been talking about for six or seven years, and we did during COVID and we all survived okay, was replacing the pews with chairs. Uh, there are lots of reasons why we, we probably should do this, but I, but I do want to acknowledge, especially given that I said at the start we want to honour and revere those that have come before us, and usually those who come before us are the ones that feel against this. Uh, look, the pews have been a wonderful thing for us. Uh, this building is about 100 years old, I assume, given no one's told me otherwise, the pews are the best part of 100 years old as well. They have served us well, they have done their job, but they also are somewhat limiting in, 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 in things. One of the reasons I say that is the longer I go for, the more your back's uh, feel pain. And so you kind of already know there is some limitations. 
Uh, they have helped us in our worship, but they are not actually part of our worship. We can worship God in any space. It doesn't necessarily need that. But I appreciate that, that some will feel uh, disagree with me on this, and you are quite uh, willing to, to speak more about this and to write about this to express that if you wish. But here are my reasons why I think it's a good idea. The simplest reason why I think it's a good idea is that we can actually fit more people. And I think that's the most simple and compelling reason. Uh, uh, our estimate is that in this space, with chairs, we can fit the best part of 25 more people in this space with chairs because the majority of people don't actually sit as close together as they can. In a chair, you've got a defined space. And so it's quite okay to sit next to someone. For most people, when it comes to pews, you spread out and you very inefficiently use them. I don't blame anyone for doing that. It's just human nature. With chairs, we can actually fit a whole heap more people and actually we have, can get more chairs than we have pews. Uh, other reasons include uh, some flexibility in how we actually use this space in our building. Pews are relatively unmovable. Uh, I'm often the one that has to move them on occasions when they've needed moving. It is not an enjoyable task. Whereas chairs that are stackable create opportunities for us in how we reimagine how to use the space, both on a Sunday and also during the week. Now, right now, given that verse we said about the plans of the Lord, I don't know what that will look like. It's hard to imagine as well because we haven't done it. But here are a couple of ideas of what it might look like. Uh, on a Sunday, it could be creating more room to spread out and have those conversations, especially with that back wall removed, for that time of morning tea or maybe some bring and share lunches. We can spread out more. It would be a lot better for those with hearing issues as well that some of those conversations take place in this room rather than in that back room. It could also be a place where we create some space for our little ones to be able to play without bumping into people. We can probably create some fairly natural, safe areas that they can play in without bumping people if we can stack some chairs and move them out of the way. It could be that we start a new congregation at some point with a more relaxed setting without the formality that pews provide. We could try and do something different with a different congregation. During the week, it might mean that we can run this space uh, for a ministry, reaching members of our community. For example, it might be a, a midweek playgroup for mums and bubs, which we've had approaches about, asking if we would do that. Another reason why we do it, and this one's more for aesthetics than, than anything compelling, but it's just creating this uniformity in, in place across the old and new space. If we are going to get to a point where we grow and we have more people towards the back, then we don't want it there to be the, the chairs at the back and the pews at the front. There's the you're in the other room and you're in the proper room. It's only a psychological thing, but there is something in that. And another point is, let's be honest, it's the one that's probably most compelling for, for some, and that's just called comfort. Uh, if we are completely honest about ourselves, not many people particularly enjoy sitting on a pew for a Genesis-length sermon. And yes, I admit, they've been a bit long lately. We have people with aches and pains and bad backs. We have those that have gone before us that we want to honour. And some of them can't even sit in pews anymore because that just hurts too much. This also can be a hindrance to us actually reaching the lost and bringing them to join us. Look, I feel the weight of the history of the pews. I also feel the weight of the argument that it's going to cost some significant cash to do that and they already are here, and we could use that money. I, I feel the weight of those, but I want to suggest that I think the best thing going forward is for us to do that, but I'm very happy afterwards, especially during the meeting, if you want to offer some opinions, do so, and we'll write something down, please do so. So then what about the rest of the future? I don't want to pretend to give you all the plans but I want to suggest what we have to be doing is prayerfully asking God to grow his church. Uh, there's a movie that... Has anyone here... It's a baseball movie, so I'm not that optimistic. But has anyone here seen uh, the Karen Costner movie from, like, I guess, the 80s? Field of Dreams? There we go! There we go. We've got some Field of Dreams people here. See, I think sometimes our attitude towards things like growing churches can be a little bit Field of Dreams-ish. Uh, if Field of Dreams is this baseball movie where, where uh, without going through the whole plot line, Kevin Costner basically 
keeps up with this voice telling him, if you build it, they will come. And he ends up basically in this cornfield in, in Iowa, in the, in the Midwest of America, in the kind of forgotten part of the country, in the middle of absolutely nowhere, builds a whopping big baseball field, a full-size baseball field with grandstands and, and lighting and everything. And suddenly, out of the cornfields, these players turn up, not just retired players, dead players turn up. And, and, and suddenly, uh, you, the, the final shot is you see this traffic jam appear as people come to watch the game. It's kind of like an Agfest traffic jam, where it's just like kilometres in every direction, <laughs> head nights everywhere, middle of nowhere, and all you had to do was build it. Didn't go out spruiking it, didn't go out, you know, didn't have a great social media presence or anything like that. He just built a baseball field and suddenly baseball happened with gazillions of people turning up. And sometimes our mindset can be, well, if we get chairs, people are going to come and sit in them. If we knock down that wall, we're suddenly going to have 50 people in that back room. If we knock down this, we might get even more people in that area, maybe create a crime room in that area, whatever. We're going to do all these things and, 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 and as long as we just do it, if we build it, they will come. I think that is the, the church equivalent of trusting in the size of your army, in the strength of your warriors, and in your horses, rather than trusting in God. Our church won't grow just because we build things. Our church will only grow if we are prayerfully asking our God to grow his church. Oh, we heard Bishop Richard uh, when he was here, we haven't seen him here before that, that, that next year the Anglican Church nationwide is, is trying to really encourage evangelism, this Hope 25 campaign. So we want to be praying that we will be out there sharing the good news of Jesus. It's not as if we want to wait till 2025. We're going to be doing that every day, but especially we want to be praying that we'll be making most of opportunities. And, and, and we're going to be coming up with some ideas of how we can reach the lost. And so I want you to join with me in praying that we will be seeking to reach the loss of circular head for the glory of God, for the love of God, and for the love of so many people who need to know the good news that we have. I said before, maybe there's an opportunity for us to start a, a midweek outreach ministry to, to, to young parents. We've been approached by that. Maybe that's something in that. Maybe it's a young adults ministry. We sort of talked about our, our different stages of, of growth. We had very little ones who turned into kind of primary age little ones who turned into high school age little ones. The next most obvious step that we, we don't have is we don't really have young adults here. But we have youth who are turning into young adults. Maybe it's going to be something like that and, 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 and helping reach that crowd. You guys have ideas and I'd love to hear them. But actually what I really love is for you to join with me in praying and pleading with the Lord to grow his church for his glory. And friends, we know that our God can do this. Every time I get to talk about, about things, I think back to my very first occasion standing at the front of this room. Not many of you were probably there, but a few of you were there, I remember. When, when I had uh, the bishop here in, uh, in, I think it's inducting, that's what you do to me, inducting me in my job to, to be the, the minister of the Anglican Church here in Circular Head. And my first words for you, when we were a relatively small group of people, was please join with me in praying to our God. Please join with me in praying from Ephesians chapter 3 that we had read at the start. It's this wonderful prayer about knowing how wide and, and long and deep is the love of God, about having Christ dwell in our hearts. And Paul finishes this prayer by acknowledging the one he prays to. He says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power as it work within us, to him be the glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, that was why I encouraged people to pray. That's what we committed to praying. And we saw a relatively small group of faithful people grow and grow and grow. To the point that we're having conversations about knocking down walls and increasing sitting capacity. God has done immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. But now we want him to do it again. 
And so part of my hesitancy about laying a, a, a clear, this is our vision, this is exactly what we're going to do, is because I don't want to make plans that go against God's plans, like we talked about from Psalm 33. But part of it is called, how can I possibly know what God might end up doing? He's probably laughing at the thought of knocking down a wall and just getting an extra 25 seats in here. But we want to pray expecting that God can work. And we can tend to be a little bit hesitant in our prayers, a lot of safe prayers. But the Bible isn't about hesitant and safe prayers. It's praying to the one who spoke and the world came into being. The one who created everyone and everything. The one who can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And friends, we want him to do that so that he receives the praise and the glory throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. God, I pray, lead us in prayer now. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that you are this incredible God. You are this God who deserves all praise and all honour and all glory. And we ask that by your Spirit, you would grow your church for your glory. You are the God who can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And so we eagerly ask for you to do that. We ask for you to grow your church, not that we would look good, but so that you would be praised, that you would be honoured, and you would be magnified, and you would be glorified through your church. We ask that you would grow your church so that so many people who are lost may be found. There are so many souls in our district who maybe have, have, have heard a bit of the good news but have been distracted by the things of this world. Others who may never have heard the good news, we pray that you'll give us such love for you, for, such love for them, that we may share the hope we have and that you and your loving kindness might bring the dead to life in your son. So Father, please do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine. For you be the glory of the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.